live from the Salvation Army National Headquarters, this is the Fight for Good podcast. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Fight for Good podcast. I'm your host, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Foley, broadcasting from National Headquarters of the Salvation Army in Alexandria, Virginia. Here with me today is our War Cry Editorial Director, my right-hand man, Jeff McDonald. How are you, sir? Sir, great to be with you. Very well. Enjoying these podcasts and the guests we have. Well, today is a very unique one because uh, our wonderful producer, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Howdy. She decided to take our last podcast and slice it and dice it and make it into two parts. So today, Jeff, we're going to be talking uh, with the second part of the interview with Lieutenant Colonel Cindy Foley, who is currently the National Treasurer and Secretary for Business Administration here at National Headquarters. And we thank our listeners for listening to part one. So up and coming is part two. Jeff, what what was were, what was some of your uh, brief takeaways of our time with Colonel Cindy? Quite a bit. First of all, that she's married to the charming Colonel <laughs> Foley. Um, so they make a dynamic duo. Um, but you know, I know she just cr- completed um, a master's in organizational leadership work, and you know, one of this. Uh, main thing she took away from that is the importance of the role of communication in organizations. And, you know, her communication skills really come through in this podcast. We really tried to focus on the fact that the Army's distinctive in that it um, recognizes the quality of women in the pulpit um, in in the mission of the gospel. And we wanted Colonel Foley to speak to, you know, what a woman's role in the Army is and how it might be changing and what she looks forward to seeing women um, develop in the army in the future but you know she took it down to a very personal level and you know she her interest in other people comes through in this discussion so that was a big takeaway also fascinating about how she found the army um and uh, grew up in it and uh, also her emphasis on you know bringing out the skills and gifts that god gives us and how that has impacted her life and uh, just, her, just her love of that, of the Army's mission really came through, I think. Well, I, you know, I obviously I'm a little biased because she's the brains in our family, you know, and I'm just the eye candy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm ex- I've been extremely proud of the work that she has done over the years because I've seen her uh, not, you know, she doesn't promote herself and, and she's not promoting a cause or she's just doing what God has called her to do. And God has placed her in some unique, uh, well, God has given her some unique opportunities that, and, and she just kind of has stepped through it. And she's our first married woman officer uh, to serve in this very distinguished role here at national headquarters. And uh, I'm just, I'm just thrilled every day to where uh, her brilliance just, you know, exceeds mine so much, but, uh, we, we really, we really had a good interview with her and we decided that it was worth a, a go around, not because she's my wife, but because of what she has to say. So we hope our listeners will stick around and, and listen to part two. So she didn't strong arm you into this two parter. <laughs> no, she didn't. In fact, when we were previewing, cause our listeners will, will know that, you know, we're trying to keep our, our podcast to a, like a 30 to 40 minute range. And Elizabeth uh, hounds me on making sure that I, you know, preview uh, the podcast. And so I was previewing this one uh, and, she, and she, she goes, are you listening to another one of your podcasts? You know, I think she thinks I download and just like to listen to myself all the time. But <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, this one is yours, you. And she was like, she, she did tell me it was a lot of fun and she had a lot to say. She, she said, I even still have a lot more to say. And I said, I, said, I know you do. But maybe we'll bring her back under a different name. <laughs> mm, that's a good idea. But, you know, she does have a lot to say. And both of your experiences is very, are in the Army are very rich and deep. Uh, I think that comes through. And again, her humility comes through as well, you know. Um, so, 
It's kind of a joy to speak with her. Well, I appreciate you joining us today on the Fight for Good podcast. Please enjoy part two of our interview with Lieutenant Colonel Cindy Foley. Jeff, Jeff, I often I often think that they got the wrong Foley over here in the the publications department because Cindy in high school she was the newspaper editor. Yeah, yeah. She, she, she's she's the grammar person. Well, you know what? I mean, the officers I've worked with they have such versatility, especially in the editorial field and in the financial field. Or you know, you bring a lot of versatility in what you do. So I think it's, they're both are good fits. But Colonel Foley, Cindy, there's so many things that I want to ask you. Um, but I have to ask you now, uh, given the challenges that the Army's facing with COVID, et cetera, what do you see as the um, immediate challenges facing the Army, particularly in the U.S. Uh, in these days? Well, I think one of the challenges we have, there's a number of challenges, and I'm sure some of them you've talked about. We're talking about today equity. The Army's really looking at diversity. There's a, you know, There's probably 20 things we could say that are all of equal importance. But one timely thing right now is um, how is the Salvation Army going to act? I hope we're not going to react. How is the Salvation Army going to act as we come out of COVID? Um, going, uh, you know, March 13th, 2020, we all entered the pandemic and, in the United States, and it was this big unknown. People were thinking, oh, it's going to be over by the summer. Salvation Army did what we always do. We went into emergency disaster mode. People need help right now. People are out of work right now. So how can we meet the spiritual and physical needs of people? We adapted our worship services. We came up with um, more food and upped our food pantry game. We found a way to find in many communities. Um, in other words, now it's, if we didn't think it was safe to be homeless before, it's really not safe now with COVID. So how can we find a way to feed and shelter and provide social distancing for people who are on the street and don't have the same access to services and PP&E and other things like that? Um, so we did what we always do. Uh, everything, you know, from, again, summer camp to people on the street to middle class families who suddenly didn't have a job. And we looked at all of that. We acted. The Salvation Army acted first. We shared our story in faith, hoping that the money to fund this increased service would come. Nobody knew. It did. You know, fundraising last spring in most communities was at kind of Christmas record numbers. The community really did support what we were doing. That continued over the summer. I know there's many officers and employees of the Salvation Army that, you know, caught their breath maybe during the end of January and February last year and then went into COVID at this Christmas level um, of service and never stopped and kept doing COVID, went right into a Christmas, probably doubled what they were doing. And um, just now are probably catching that second breath after a year of very intense service. So what I hope and pray for is this extra attention the Salvation Army has received by doing what we always do, being in the community, being ready to act and react and provide services despite the circumstance, the people we are all the time when the lights aren't on us, I hope now that um, in many communities people have been reminded, oh, that's right, the Salvation Army is here. They do do a great job with um, the trust that we give in with them. I hope we'll continue to do that, not give up this light and this spotlight that we've been given, but continue to grow the relationships that have started with COVID, continue to reach out to donors and community leaders and government leaders and business and nonprofit and other um, denominations within the Christian community, and let this be another step up that we took and continue to walk up that staircase and continue to grow our presence and our ability to, again, meet the spiritual and physical needs of people in the community from this point. We should not step back. Uh, God has blessed us. In faith, he's shown us that he will provide what we need. Um, again, we need to bring more, we need to grow this army because you know, the officers and soldiers and employees can't do it on their own. So it's a great time to bring more people onto the team with us. And while we're focusing 
continuing to focus on the community and to grow that, um, that ability to meet need. On the other hand, we have to figure out what is church going to look like post-COVID? I was actually talking to another um, Salvation Army officer about this literally last night. And I said, uh, uh, this person's in the Pacific Northwest. What do you think uh, the life of the Salvation Army Corps is going to look like? You know, once once the uh, pandemic sign comes off the front door, do you think people are just going to rush back into the building? Well, if you read a lot of things right now, um, many church leaders are saying, no, people have gotten really comfortable staying at their home. If you look to Europe, a lot of times we're about 20 years what's behind Europe and what's going on with the church. Um, not very many people walk into actually a religious building on a Sunday or any other day of the week in Europe. So I think this is a real a time for the Salvation Army, other churches to look like um, people need Christian fellowship that can be done remotely. It can be done in person. It can be done through special events, can be done on Sunday or Wednesday night. Um, it can be with kids or teenagers or seniors or families. But I think we literally have to be talking right now and coming up again, what is this plan? What will our strategy be to show people that um, religious worship and the fellowship of believers is still important? It is still a need that people have, and we need to adapt that. What will people want it to be like for core that maybe have struggled and their congregations were were either stagnant or already declining? You know, if you haven't really met in person for a number of months or maybe even a year, you know, it's a great time to grab the leaders of that congregation, even if you're just a few of you, grab together and recreate yourself. And the Salvation Army gives great freedom to being able to say, this is what we need to do. This is um, some of the elements in our worship that we can bring in. I hope people don't give up um, you know, streaming their services because there's always going to be people who can't leave their home, um, shut-ins and things that haven't been able to benefit from maybe the congregation that they um, most identify with. Uh, in our own congregation, we see people um, maybe who lived in this area before, but we'll get on and to our stream service on a Sunday, and there's people from Canada and Michigan and Florida and all over the place, people who have a love for the people of that congregation and still want to worship together, even though they're not um, physically located in that community anymore. So I think the Salvation Army and many churches are going to have to figure out how do we meet the needs of people right now, individuals, families, people of all ages, and find that new way. So, I mean, how many times in someone's life or the life of a church do you get to go back to that blank, brand new chalkboard? In these days, we call it that whiteboard and recreate what you're doing, um, you know, as a congregation. So I hope people will really embrace that challenge and just be creative um, to find, and I don't know, again, inspired and motivated to say, hey, we got to redo and let's talk about this. Let's go together and figure this out. Officers can't do it alone. It needs to be officers and soldiers and the key leaders of a congregation together to say, uh, this is who we are. And who can we, you know, who do we want to be as a congregation and go out and make it happen? And I have all faith that they can really do that in a successful way. Boy, that's, um, you've given us plenty of fodder for future podcasts. It's a great subject. Thank you. We'll do follow up on that for sure. Your passion is coming through as you're sharing with us. Um, how, so I'd like to backtrack a bit and just, you know, think about or hear about how uh, you met the Army at first, and how did you become a Salvation Army officer? So I, I can't help but wonder if maybe uh, my hus my husband uh, triggered you asking that question. So I have basically the what? political answer and the non-political okay? answer. <laughs> I hope that's okay. It is. It's kind of funny. Oh. So the real truth is I met the Salvation Army when the officer's children stole my horse. And 
I'm from a little town in Eastern oh, Oregon. By the little- way, I never get tired of this story. <laughs> she I'm has from- a lot of stories. I never get tired of this. <laughs> yeah, one. this is absolutely true. So I'm from Pendleton, Oregon, a little, again, a little town, uh, about 14,000 people when I was growing up, literally more cows than people. And <laughs> I still lived in a, I hadn't moved to the farm yet, still lived in a regular neighborhood, but my dad and I each had a horse and we rented a little pasture about maybe six blocks from our house. And I, I was seven, you know, this is 1970, right? Uh, a very safe community. I would just walk over uh, to the pasture, uh, bridle my horse, stand on the fence, jump on him and just ride him all over the neighborhood. And so one of the things you do when you're seven years old in 1970 in the little town where you just have to be home by dark um, and you don't really have any money, you ride your horse over to the bowling alley you tie him outside and you go inside and you watch teenagers playing pinball and bowling. And if you're really lucky, you've done some chore and you have a dime and you can get a candy from the candy machine. So one day I came out of the bowling alley. My horse was no longer tied there. I walked around the neighborhood and found him and uh, told the, the officer's children, that's my horse. And they were really smart little evangelists. They knew if they could get me to go to church with them, that they could get a prize. So uh, they maneuvered that. I quickly forgave them. We all became best friends as uh, they had just moved to the neighborhood and we would be going to school together in probably about two months. And um, that kind of started my journey with the Salvation Army. My parents didn't attend church then. Um, we moved to the farm about a year later. So my dad basically had about you know three full-time jobs. We had a farm. We were part of the family business and many years we had our own business besides. So um, they, so I just really embraced the activities of the Salvation Army and they were really supportive. They didn't, you know, come with me, but they loved that I was so excited about Salvation Army scouting programs and things. And um, after a couple of years, they invited my dad to be part of the advisory board. And so they kind of got involved that way. And um, by the time I was in high school, my parents had come to faith. They began attending the Salvation Army when I was as their church home when I was about 17. And um, besides, again, serving as leaders of the local advisory board, they became soldiers. And by the time I became ordained as an officer at 22, my dad was kind of the head layperson, what the Salvation Army would call the core sergeant major of our little congregation in Pendleton, Oregon. And my parents were... Um, active soldiers, local officers, which means leaders in the congregation. And my mom even worked for free, for no pay as the bookkeeper for about 15 years um, because one of my dad's businesses was located across the street from the core by that time. And um, I think when they eventually started paying her, I think they started at minimum wage. So um, my mom was a full-time bookkeeper for my dad's business, full-time bookkeeper for the Salvation Army. And Again, he served as a volunteer and part of the congregation um, until his death. And because he raised the money for the current Salvation Army building there, um, the chapel is um, a memorial to my dad. So again, just like we talked about kind of with leadership, I um, the Salvation Army in Pendleton, Oregon, when I was little, was maybe like 11 people at the most, quite many Sundays less than that. So they had a lot of need for people, and I was a kid that loved to serve and, you know, was energized again by the Holy Spirit within me. So, you know, when I was 11 years old in fifth grade and they said, could you be a Sunday school teacher? Because somebody has to um, watch the kids during the service. And I'm telling you, there was literally nobody else. Um, I just embraced those opportunities, and the Salvation Army taught me how to be a Sunday school teacher taught me how to be a leader of youth groups. And basically, if I wanted to benefit from the youth groups of the Salvation Army, I had to learn to lead them because there was just no one else to do it. Um, So again, God grew me that. And I just loved the programs. And I think God helped me to fall in love with loving people and serving people. And um, that became a calling to officership and went to college, did a few years of college for elementary education, and then went to the Salvation Army's training college, was ordained, and again, joined my husband on this journey. And it's now 36 years later. I, uh, I feel like I just uh, heard a slice of Americana. And also, uh, also 
your uh, hints of your strong work ethic, and I see where it comes from. <laughs> um, you recently completed your master's work in organizational leadership. What are a few takeaways you would like to see further developed in the Army? You know, the project I did um, in my master's studies was um, a focus on um, developing a positive organizational culture. And although there's many avenues that contribute to that, um, part of what I focused on was positive communication and how improving um, communication on every level from supervisor to team member, from organizational leader to team leaders, from organizational leader to the entire organization, whether that's written, verbal, in-person, via video, via branding on the walls. And as I share this, it's all going to sound familiar to, to you, Tim and Jeff, because you're going to think, oh, this that sounds familiar because we're doing that at National Headquarters. Um, but I really focused on those things. And I feel like uh, when, you know, no matter where somebody is, if it's in your own workplace or in maybe a volunteer organization or in your congregation, everybody and their brother can take a pen and make a list of all the things that are wrong and maybe have a couple of ideas what you could do to make them right. But part of the challenge is you can't make everything the number one priority. You have to start somewhere. And in my master's studies as well, as I looked at all the opportunities um, and all the things that go into building a positive organizational culture and how that would benefit people, again, by educating, inspiring, motivating, and resourcing people to be able to do the mission of the organization, regardless of what that organization is. One of the things I felt is where you can make a quick change in many times with, with little or no money was by focusing on communication. So we've taken um, what I studied and the aspects of my project, and we've increased at National Headquarters our ability to communicate with each other. Some of it's still under construction, but some of the things that we have done to put um, these communication principles into practice was to have branding and um, throughout the building. So we're reminding people, if you're just walking down the hall to the dining room, you'll be reminded what is our mission, what we're doing about it. You might be the person who writes the check or the person that writes an email or uh, produces a podcast or creates a digital image, but you contribute to the fact that a child is given a coat on a winter day in Detroit, Michigan, or a homeless person has a warm bed and a warm meal in um, Cheyenne, Wyoming. And regardless, again, of the organization or people's roles, they have to be reminded what they're doing makes a difference. You have to be reminded what is the organization doing and feel like you know what's going on and why decisions are being made. So again, we found creative ways to do that from um, meetings in the middle where our national commander or visiting guests or other leaders in our organization can literally stand in a, a staircase and share information with everybody who's in the building, employees, officers, guests that might happen to be there that day. We have video screens that share the story of our work and our mission across the United States on two different floors. You can see what's going on if you happen to walk by. We, are, um, we did communication training to remind and train and equip supervisors to better communicate with the people on their team. Um, so again, whether it's in writing or verbal or through digital means, communication is a key that makes a quick change about how the organization moves and how team members at all levels of administration um, know where they fit into the whole organization and how they can develop themselves, develop their team, and develop the organization. So that's a really exciting topic for me. Team building and all the other things is important as well, but um, finding ways to have positive communication in any organization is a quick way to make a positive change in your culture. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. There's a, <laughs> you've, you've hit on a lot of subjects for us and it's uh Really insightful. You know, that communication, I, I noticed too, is becoming more of a two-way street, not just from top-down leadership, 
but it's uh, o- opening up channels throughout the organization, especially, especially at national headquarters for, for dialogue. And I guess it develops a, a, a commonality and a, a morale booster to do so. It is. You know, one of the things I love about uh, communication is that, it, like as we said, in essence, it's free. And in America, I think for the most part, we think it's it's our right. And most most organizations now, I think, are trying to find ways to give a voice to everyone throughout the organization. And it's so easy. Again, you don't have to be a senior supervisor where you are. Um, you you can share your opinion in an appropriate manner. And you can find ways to listen and to enable other people to share their opinion. I'll give you an example. One of the things I personally have to work on is I think fast, I talk fast, I can um, assimilate a lot of information quickly, again, kind of figure out, okay, this is a situation, this is all the factors, where do we need to go, how does this fit into our overall strategy, here's the steps, one, two, three, okay, these are the people that could do that. This is the person that could write this up. This is how we could announce it and share it. Here's the plan. Okay, let's go. So I'm, you know, if I'm sitting at a board table or even at a lunch table, I can quickly go through all of those steps. But what I found as a leader is I think and reason and process quickly, but not everybody in the team or everyone around the table does. So one of my biggest challenges as a leader is having to slow down because the best idea or the idea that might just make all the difference or make what we're doing richer and more successful could be with the person that maybe is not directly related at all, but can speak into the situation, but they have to have time to think about it. And 20 minutes from now, when we're about 10 agenda items past that, they have the information and the idea that's going to spark um better success or ultimate success of what we were talking about. So communication even involves that, listening and waiting or learning to come back to something, like finding ways to invite everybody into the conversation in the way that they're best wired to participate. You're going to make me cry. Yeah, there's so many elements to that, but it's and it's exciting. And you know what? It doesn't go right all the time. But that's also the great thing about communication if we're really focusing on it and developing it, then, you know, everything goes wrong at some point, right? No journey is straight. So, you know what, if we hit a crick in the road or we took a misstep, if we're all talking about it and sharing and everybody feels like they can do that and they'll step out of their own fear and do it, well, then we can, we can correct our course as we go along. And again, ultimately, not only will we reach that destination, in reality, we'll probably surpass it and everybody's going to be better for the journey because we all were transformed and changed and enabled, again, I believe by the Holy Spirit as we work together towards that goal. So it's crazy to think communication, which in many ways doesn't even take a lot of training, we just have to be willing to do it, to share, to listen, and to open those doors. And um, we'll be different, and the organization will be different. And you know what? Um, as we improve our organization, we improve our ability to meet more human need. So what we do here in Alexandria to better communicate and build our positive culture ultimately makes the Salvation Army in San Diego and share it in Wyoming and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Louisiana and everywhere else, better. We will provide better service, even just by focusing on communication in our little corner of the world. Wonderful. I just read a quote by uh, Antoine de saint Exupéry saying, if you, if you want uh, people to build a boat, you just don't teach them carpentry at first. You take them to the sea and show them the vision of the sea and, and, and the desire to explore it. So, boy, you've given us a lot to think about. As one who does not necessarily think quickly on their feet, I appreciate your, your awareness of those of us who uh, take a little more time to process than you're able to. Well, Jeff, Jeff, I do know this. I do know that Elizabeth is a hero to oh, Colonel Smith. I was just thinking that. Oh, 
Elizabeth was my incredible assistant as I had to finalize my written project and bring in uh, Excel tables and things into a document. That is nice skill set. So you remember I said about 5 million times in this conversation, <laughs> you build a team and you bring the team numbers you need. And I'm so thrilled that Elizabeth is literally the most wonderful person I've ever met. And <laughs> I tried to give her, I tried to give her notice, but occasionally I had to, uh, text her and say, Elizabeth. And the crazy thing about Elizabeth, but the exciting thing again about God's work and about ministry is Elizabeth has all these skills in her, the very tip of her pinky that I think I will never have. And Elizabeth, I believe God has gifted you in that way. And what I would struggle with for hours or days and literally would never really be able to do, Elizabeth would turn these things around in about five minutes. And uh, so again, just the just an example of how, you know, when we work together, um, we can accomplish great things because everybody has their part to play and God's enable us all um, to be able to play that part if we're willing to do it. Well, last night you asked me to sit beside you on the bed. You were working on a PowerPoint and you're like, well, just sit here, you know, and I'm thinking, where's Elizabeth? I I don't know. I know you were going to ask me something about it. And you did. You actually asked me a question how to copy this. And in the back of my mind, I was like, and then I went to Google. Yeah. And we didn't want to bother. We didn't want to bother Elizabeth after hours, but I know Elizabeth, you've been, you've been um, very, very helpful to uh, Colonel Cindy. And uh, so, and many, many of us here benefit from, a lot of stuff nobody ever sees, but uh, you're an example of a great team player, and you're an example of a hero to my wife. Gee mm-hmm. yeah. whiz. <laughs> Thanks, guys. But don't well, ask yeah. for a no. raise. Don't no. ask for <laughs> Elizabeth, that's absolutely true. You are. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're we great. do appreciate you so much and all you do to help us move forward in our work. But, Colonel Cindy, we're really grateful for, obviously, I'll put my professional hat on as a uh, a member of the NHQ team here, um, all the things that you do uh, that go unnoticed. Uh, obviously, if you and your team weren't addressing those things, it would be noticed. Uh, from everything to making sure that people are paid on time, that the lights remain on, and we haven't even talked about this massive uh, re- rebuilding, uh, remodeling project that you engaged in, you started to engage in well before COVID and how you've yeah, had to In the manage. first 10 minutes I was in this building. Yes. In my position, was it that quick? It was. I hadn't oh. been 10 minutes before the national commander came in and closed the door oh, and said, wow. here, this is what I'm going to need you to do. So you've done a, you've done a, uh, an incredible thing. I think, I think, uh, officers across the country are in, should be indebted uh, to what you have done uh, in your officership. You, God has gifted you with some incredible insight and abilities. Uh, I know that uh, Joan Kroc w- would would just be very pleasant and talk to me, but she wanted to bypass me and get right to you because she knew things were going to get done. Um, and I I just see that you have a lot to say and a lot to speak into the current uh, Salvation Army administration internationally and nationally, as well as giving hope, because uh, I watch what you do with young officers who call you. Uh, I watched that last night, a young officer calling you for, for advice and the mentoring that you do. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, we can't even put it into words, but we thank you for for uh, what you've shared with us today. You're welcome. I've enjoyed the conversation, enjoyed, you know, listen to the podcast as we listen to the car, usually driving to work or, or going home. And I think, you know, just my encouragement to everyone would be, it doesn't matter what your gender or your age or your position is. God is enabling each one of us to make a difference in the world right around us. And all he's asking is for us to be willing. And if we accept his guidance and um, the resources he will give us, he literally will enable us um, to make a change. And the exciting thing about you know that kind of journey with God is not only do we make a difference in people and circumstances around us, but God changes us at the same time. 
So my encouragement to everybody is uh, open the door and walk in faith with God, and he will take you to incredible places that you never imagined. Well, that's going to end this episode of the Fight for Good podcast. Be sure to subscribe to Fight for Good wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to follow the War Cry in Peer Magazine on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find the War Cry at www.thewarcry.org. There we drop each issue of the War Cry free for you to read at the beginning of each month. Uh, And we will continue to do the same with Peer Magazine as we move forward. We thank you for taking a few moments out of your day and being a faithful listener to our faith, uh, our Fight for Good podcast. We encourage you to tell your friends. And thank you for your support of the Salvation Army. Until next time, this has been the Fight for Good podcast. Bye for now. Subscribe to Fight for Good wherever you listen to podcasts.